So I'd like to welcome Robert Duff back again um, to talk to you about um, peatland restoration for nature and ecosystem services. And this is done with Sophie Lang as well. Is Sophie here? She, she is. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, uh, yeah, Robert, thank you. Great. Yeah, so we're going to do a double act um, and we're going to talk uh, a bit more about the Marches Mosses Bog Life Project, which relates to Fens, Wixell and Bettersfield Mosses, which Fred has uh, already talked to you about. Um, we, our project was six years and it's coming to an end, but it actually follows on. It was uh, preceded by 25 years of uh, earlier restoration. Um, which is probably why Fred's figures about the carbon that we're, we're almost already sort of reached a point where we've got sufficient cover um, from a carbon point of view. It kind of reflects the restoration before the project. So what I'm going to do is just um, give you a quick overview and, and it's incredibly uh, challenging to try and sum up the amount of work that's happened over that time, but I'll, I'll give it a go. Um, and our focus has been on trying to revive and restore the hydrology of, of this really important uh, site. So I'm going to give you a bit of the context in history, tell you about some of the big stuff going on about arterial drainage, um, look at the peat funding technique that we've applied, um, mention the woodland to bog restoration, and if time allows, hopefully just uh, mention some of the work we're doing on the bog edge restoration as well. And then Sophie's going to uh, wrap it up with uh, coverage of some of the monitoring results. So um, I know many of you will be familiar, but some of you won't be familiar with um, the Fens, Wixell and Bettersfield mosses. It's one lowland raised bog. It's the UK's third largest lowland raised bog. Uh, it's a SSSI, it's a special area of conservation and a Ramsar site. Um, it's about two and a half thousand acres or a uh, thousand hectares in new currency and um, it, it's a cross-border site uh, so a third of it's in England and two-thirds on, on in, in, in Wales um, and it's it's managed uh, by Natural England on behalf of the uh, Natural Resources Wales. The Shropshire Wildlife Trust have one part called Wem Moss in the foreground uh, which is a, a national nature reserve, which they own and manage themselves. Uh, it, it, it was um, acquired as a nature reserve 30 years ago. Uh, until then, uh, it was being uh, subject to peat extraction, commercial exploitation. And that was all set to increase in the late 80s, early 90s. And there was, a, there was an uproar and a campaign against it, which eventually led to the Nature Conservancy Council acquiring this, the site. Um, it's, a, it's a really severely um, uh, degraded site um, and it features a cut drain every 10 metres or so, um, which is a reflection of the legacy of so several hundred years of, of uh, exploitation through either hand cutting or, or latterly commercial peat extraction. Um, it was also the, the, the integrity of the bog was severely compromised also by um, the, uh, the sort of, uh, uh, drainage related um, to can canal creation. The Shropshire Union Canal runs, cuts across parts of the moss. And all, in, in the 1860s, a railway was cut across, which also severed part of the moss. Um, I'm sorry the uh, wording's fall, fallen off the screen there, but it's, it, it, and that latterly it's been impacted by, um, in the 1960s, by quite a lot of afforestation on the edges of the moss. So we've probably uh, got about between 100 and 150 hectares of, of afforestation around the site. But despite all of that, as, Pete, uh, uh, as Fred has said, um, it, it still retains quite deep peat, quite deep reserve. We, we think the original depth of peat at this site in a pristine uh, state would have been about eight, eight or nine metres. So the fact that we've got three and a half as an, as an average, you know, does show you um, how much we've lost. A lot of that would have been through slumpage because of the uh, drainage work. Also to mention that um, as well as the afforestation, um, you know, at, at, 
the time of enclosure in the early 1800s, there was quite a lot of encroachment around the edges of the bog by, you know, by um, setting up agricultural uh, enterprises. So there was, uh, you know, quite a lot of the edges of the moss are under uh, grazed pasture, etc. But despite all of that, um, because it's such a huge site and because it, you know, th there was uh, a mixture of, of hand cutting, which is very slow, uh, has very slow impact on the site. Uh, a lot of the really important wildlife associated with this bog have managed to hang on in the, uh, in, the in the sort of, uh, sort of uh, nooks and crannies of the, the peat cutting areas. So. It, it still retains quite a lot of a rich biodiversity, um, although it is quite fragmented and, and dispersed. So we have some right, really nice uh, sort of uh, wildlife things that occur. So we've got a really strong population of the specialist white-faced darter, dragonfly. Um, we've got uh, uh, 13 species of sphagnum moss, um, rare, rare spiders, etc. It's a, it's a very um, niche, habitat lowland raised bogs um, and uh, we, you know we've got a, a, a fine um, array of, of species so our goal at this site is very much biodiversity driven um, and the carbon benefits are secondary so what we're trying to do is restore a, a, a bog ecosystem so in a pristine site uh, pristine state this would be what your, your lovely bog um, would look like. It would have this lovely dome um, and, and uh, uh, you know, this is the classic um, image and the Fens and Wixel would have resembled this in, in one way or another. Um, but what we've actually got as a result of all the peat cutting and the peat extraction is a, uh, a bog topography, which is, is kind of uh, undulating with hummocks and hollows. Um, so trying to restore bog habitat on this is quite challenging because you're you're dealing with a very disrupted hydrology um, and you're trying to to manage the water flows off uh, off off this complicated topography really and and the you know you can easily end up with large areas of flooded low areas or high and dry areas. Um, so this just this is an exaggerated uh, diagram, by the way. So it's it's uh, it's a bit exaggerated by ten times. But this was drawn up by Richard Lindsay when he first came to um, look at Fens and Wixel about thirty years ago. So um, as I mentioned, all the drainage ditches we have on on Fens and Wixel every ten meters, but. Um, to allow all the peat extraction in the past, there was a lot of uh, arterial drains that were established across the moss to really take all the main flows away from the site. Um, and there's a whole network of them that you can see, see up here. And one of the biggest actions that have been taken over the last 30 years is to start uh, reverse engineering that, that drainage network. And, and so uh, I call it replumbing the, the peat landscape. Um, so, we've over the years, um, there's been various projects, quite significant engineering projects really, to, to allow us to um, start to block or uh, sort of recreate the conditions we need for lowland raised bog habitat. So the first one of these was called Wixel um, Manor Drain Diversion. So um, on the edges, we a lot of water from the edges of the mosses. Um, from the farmland has ended up being diverted into the bog. And that mineral water is very enriched and it's it's very different because a, a bog is dependent on natural rainwater, which is uh, nutrient poor. Um, so if you have this injection of, of mineral water, it's very enriched and you get a completely different species assemblage. You get fen habitat, etc. cetera. Um, and also a lot of that uh, water that was coming off mineral ground was also carrying carrying septic tank type uh, pollutants etc. So one of our first first action was the the Wixall Manor drain diversion, which ended up um, diverting that dirty water away fr from the moss. 
another another scheme that was put in was was that was to um, uh, in, put a, a large bisqueen uh, dam, peak dam across the moss, across the, one of these big arterial drains, so that we were um, re-establishing the natural um, watersheds. So this site has two watersheds. Half of the site sheds to the River Severn and half sheds to the River Dee in, in the north. Um, and so by re-establishing this large peat bund, we were able to separate the drainage so that it was falling in the right direction again. Uh, about 10 years ago, um, the main outfall from Fens Moss, that number three there with a star, um, that was uh, evacuating huge volumes of water from the site every year. So um, a major uh, intervention was to create a weir dam system, which allowed uh, us to raise the water level by a significant amount and hold a lot more water on the site during the winter time. Uh, and more recently, and one of the schemes I'll, I'll touch on very quickly, is we've acquired land at number four um, on an area called World's End, which is part of a pump drainage scheme. The Wildlife Trust managed to buy the land through the life project. And as, as part of it, we're trying to de-aggregate this peatland land that we've bought and the Wildlife Trust have bought and it, uh, is adjacent to our existing nature reserve, de-aggregate it from the pump drainage system. So we're putting in a new sort of uh, system of uh, buns, clay buns, to protect the, our adjacent landowners so we can separate our, la our peatland from, from uh, having an impact on, on their, uh, the land that they own and manage. So um, I'm going to talk a bit more about that. And then finally, uh, as part of the LIFE project last year, there was a major scheme to divert one of the large um, drains that was cut across the bog. That it carried a lot of mineral water from uh, agricultural areas beyond and, and took the shortest route, which meant cutting through the bog. And what we've been able to do is divert that by creating a new channel on the edge of the bog off of the peatland. Um, and a two and a half kilometer section of, of drainage has been pushed to the edge of the bog. And the, the benefits of doing that means that in, it, we, we are now able to restore the, the peatland either side of that drain. We couldn't do it before because we were worried about if this enriched water if flowed over into the bog, you'd get a completely different type of habitat that we're not interested in. So, um, those, those are the sort of arterial drainage changes we've done. In terms of the uh, middle of the moss, a lot, a lot of the, the first phase of work, we call it the first fix of the moss, was done between 1992 and 2015. And it involved that, that sort of uh, very conventional uh, approach of, of blocking ditches and, and the peak cuttings. Um, we were quite lucky that we've had the benefit of um, some of the our estate workers used to work for the peat cutting company, so they have an uh, amazing knowledge of the peatland itself and and how to sort of uh, uh, how to work the peat, but also how to restore it. So that's we, that we've greatly benefited from that knowledge. And um, over 25 years, that's really we've had this first fix of the moss, which allowed a lot of the vegetation and sphagnum to to uh, colonise where where it could. Um, and then. During the LIFE project, we've, we've, which started uh, six years ago, we, we, we've, we've applied a new technique called linear peat bunding, which was um, something that we saw being used up, up in Cumbria by, the, by a sister project up there. And the, um, the reason we needed to do this was because it, although we were sort of the, the blocking the ditches was, was having some benefit. We were noticing a large areas that were, were still covered by millennia, purple moor grass, and not really reverting back to the sphagnum community that we're really targeting. Um, so we we needed something else to, um, to, to, to raise those water levels. So the bunding technique we've applied on a, on a large scale, and hopefully this video will work. So, what bunding involves is um, basically trying to repack 
the peat um, in, a, in, in linear um, runs and to use the properties of peat itself. The really saturated peat has a sort of uh, impermeability quality. Uh, so it's sort of like clay-like. So um, if, if you can bring that really saturated peat about a, a meter below, yeah, about a meter deep and bring it to the surface and repack it, then you get this kind of um, the, the peat, the, the damaged peat layer that you get at the top. Um, you can retain the water table at, at, at a higher level, if that makes sense. So we, the first, the half, half a meter of peat um, is usually quite degraded because it's drying out and uh, every, every summer and you get the, the chemical properties of the peat changes. So by bringing up this really wet peat, it really helps retain the water um, in linear buns. Um, so it acts like a curb stone of, of, uh, of wet, soggy peat holding the water. And with this, we get a, a sort of instant um, benefit from water table being raised. Sorry, there we go. So this is an example of an area that um, was uh, bunded and the winter after it was bunded. So we get an instant um, retention of water that was previously leaking off these areas. Um, so it's been, it's been a bit of a game changer and transformative in terms of uh, securing the water table that we're looking for on, on the moss to get sphagnum moss growing. You, you might say, oh, that looks too, too, that looks you know, far too flooded and uh, too wet. And, and it is initially, but very quickly, sphagnum moss and the other uh, sedges uh, establish in these areas. And, and uh, so it's a temporary phase that they look this, this wet. So we've applied this peat bunding technique widely across the moss, um, over 600 he hectares on, on, across the, the nature reserve. Um, it slows the flow. I mean, we've done it in, in two ways. We've done cell bunding, which create 20 by 20 meter cells. Um, so if you think of sort of rice paddy cells, they're a bit like that. Um, and they're really uh, effective uh, at uh, tackling the de degraded um, permeable surface peat. And we've used that technique to create a sort of, if you think, look at the blue area around the edges, we've almost done a ring around the core of the site. Um, and then in the middle, in the green areas, we've, we've used, the, we've used selectively used the, the, the bunding, but more a lot using um, contours to guide where the buns go. That be, the middle of the site is where we've done our first phase of restoration I was referring to, you know, in the first 20, uh, 25 years. And then I think it'd be worth just uh, highlighting that um, the, pur the purple areas, we, this technique has been so useful and, and um, transformative for the site that we've, we've extended it into the purple areas, which we weren't originally planning to uh, look at. Um, so we've, we've done a lot more bunding than we envisaged at the beginning. And if you laid all these buns in a line, they, they would go all the way from Shropshire to, to London. We've done 250 kilometers of, of this technique. This is a couple of views of uh, taken in March this year of one of the bunded areas at Northeast Fens. And you can see that they're, they're sort of wet and you can see that the vegetation is starting to cover. So they, whilst they're initially very wet, the vegetation quickly establishes. And obviously we've got to, we, we're, you know, we've got to be thinking about conditions that we're getting now with climate change in that we get real extreme uh, drops in our water table in, in, the, uh, in the summertime. Fens and Wixel is right at the edge of where you get bulk formation. We've got relatively low rainfall, 700 millimetres a year. So we've got to hold on to every, rain, every bit of rain that we can, um, which is the aim of this technique really. This is an example of when moss where we've applied the, the contour bunding onto one of our the existing peak domes that we've got left. So we've uh, if you look at the top, you can see that we've uh, there's a, a sort of open area in the middle where we've 
we've left uh, unbunded, which and we've just done a contour bund around that. Um, just to point out that about 15 years ago, they tried an, an, another technique to restore the, the water table on here, and they used this plastic pie, a plastic piling to ring the, the moss. Um, unfortunately, that wasn't very successful, and the, where, whereas the bunding has been incredibly successful at re-wetting this site. Oh, what's happened there? Uh, right, so now just to quickly um, touch on the uh, forest to bond, forest to bog restoration. So on the north side of the, the, the moss, um, we, as part of the project and, and actually um, earlier phases, there's been clearance, uh, clear fell of, uh, of, of conifers from, from the site. Um, some of that took place in early in that two, um, 1998, some of it in 2009, and more recently under the Bog Life project, we, we cleared 50 hectares in 2019. Um, just if you just look at those two blue circles, that, that's where we uh, there was an experiment looking at the um, greenhouse gas emissions, and I'm going to touch on that in a minute. But if you just uh, keep notice those points, that'd be good. So 2019, we clear felled the site. Um, NRW uh, undertook that action for us as, as the project. All the harvested uh, materials were taken and have been utilized, you know, productive, um, productive uses. And after that, we went in and um, used this bunding technique with ex-forestry areas, you've got the added um, task of having to, to remove the root plates. So as you go along bunding, um, you have to have a, 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 dig, a digger going ahead of the bunding, which is removing the, the root plates and, and putting them to one side. So it is a bit more costly to restore uh, these, these areas. But it, it is uh, on a journey back to, to being lovely bog habitat. And um, how do we know that? Well, um, the previous areas that were converted from uh, forest to bog, um, we've, we've got, there was a research study done in 2015, the results were only published in 2020, which was looking at the, the carbon uh, gas balance um, measured for 12 months on, on three areas. They looked at a, a sort of um, a control area where, where, where there was a uh, it was one of our uncut bits of bog, the best bog that we have on the site. So there was no forest on there. Uh, they looked at an area that had been clear felled six years before, and then they looked at an area that had been clear felled 17 years before, the one that was undertaken in 1998 uh, that I referred to. Um, and what what they what they found obviously is the luck. Uh, you know, our best bit of uncut bog on the site is still a, a sink, which is great. Um, the area that was cut six years ago is is still is is a source at the moment, but after 17 years, the the um, clear fell area, which was actually you know, the be our best sink and is sequestering the most, is actually you know that ex forest area. So we can be confident that in in due course these areas will return back to bog and also functioning in terms of sequestering carbon. I don't know how I'm doing for time. Yeah, I have time, so if you want to talk. Yeah, yeah. Well. yeah. good. I will skip over and to, and hand over to Sophie. OK, I'm just going to go through a few of our monitoring results. So this is just a very quick overview of what our monitoring has been showing us. Um, the lovely picture we have there is of Bettlefield Moss, which is one of our areas which was bunded initially. So it's one of the places which we've got more results for. So this is our water data for Bettlefield. Um, so the buns were done in a mix of 2018 to 2019, and then a few were done in 2017 and 2018. They Basically, the water table, as you can see, so the top graph is the mean annual water data, and then the lower graph shows all of our water data. So as you can see from all of our water data, there's a lot of up and downs up until when it was bunded. And then when it was bunded, in general, 
it starts to go up. So that last little bit at the end where you can see it um, peaking up is sort of after the buns. Um, our optimum we're looking at for this is actually plus or minus 10 for water table, because as Robert said, it initially gets wetter, but then in the long term, we're expecting it to dry out. So for the kind of time period we're looking at here, the slightly wetter data is potentially better because it means once it has dried out a little bit, it should still be roughly where we want it to be. Um, so these are some maps. The dots are where real, the real data was taken from. And then the map, um, the rest of it is extrapolated data. Um, so looking at the data on the ground, the extrapolated data does appear to make sense. So even though it's a model, it does appear to be a model that makes sense. Um, the area, so here, this is the Welsh side. So this is our uncut side of Bettersfield, um, which is why, oh yeah, I should have mentioned, these purple lines here are where the buns are. So what Robert was showing you beforehand, and then this is the cell bunding on the English side, which was previously cut. Um, it is worth mentioning that the ground levels are quite different. So on the Welsh side of Bettersfield, this side, we have up to six metres of peat, and the ground is noticeably higher than on the cut area, where we've got lower, so more like three to four metres of peat. Um, so the, this is done to so the graph, sorry, the map is showing um, the amount of time it's within the optimal conditions. So the optimal conditions on this are ever presented by turquoise. So the more time it's in the optimal conditions, the more turquoise it is. If it's in dry some of the time, it goes more towards grey. And if it's wet some of the time, it goes more towards blue. So the very straight dark blue line is the canal because that's always obviously too wet. Um, Bettersfield is separated from the rest of the moss by the canal, but it would originally have been part of the same peat body. Um, so just looking at some of the other bits of the site, Bettersfield again is this bit here. So we're looking at some of our vegetation data. This survey was only done on the uncut areas. So the areas that weren't commercially cut for peat. So these are the areas which historically have been better for the site because they didn't, they, well, it's where the top layer of peat wasn't removed. So it kept a lot of its original vegetation. <coughs> So in areas like this, we would hope that they were coming up as um, NVC category M18, which is lowland raised bog habitat. And as you can see, most of them are, which is kind of good. And this is the sort of habitat we are trying to encourage over the rest of the bog. Um, some areas were affected by drainage historically, because even though they weren't cut, the areas all around them, so the rest of the bog has been cut. So even though these weren't directly drained, they have been affected by drainage. So as Robert showed you, we've still been doing bunding around these areas to try and keep the water onto them and to keep them into these nice habitats. Um, some of the areas like Wem have come out as wet heath rather than lowland raised bog, but the water table is getting wetter there. So it's getting more within the <coughs> water table you'd expect for a lowland raised bog, and the species are starting to develop. So as you can see in the picture, of WEM, which is this picture here. We've got a lot of cotton grass and sphagnum starting to form, but it is only just really starting to spread. We do have some nice areas on WEM, so don't want to criticise it too much. And it is have, it does have a really healthy population of sphagnum pulchrum, which is one of our really rare bog mosses. So there are some really nice and really positive findings there. And we're hoping that it will continue in the right direction. So over time, it will start to look a little bit more like some of the other areas which are already in lowland raised bog habitat. This survey here is an ongoing survey and is also part of a national project. So they're surveyed every four years. So one of the reasons why we're like picking out this is it's a survey that's most likely to carry on. So it's most likely to be carried on in another four years time and then continue on from that. So it's one of the areas which we can use as a sort of benchmark in future to make sure things are continuing as we'd like them to. This is also looking at vegetation data, but in a very different way. We had a drone flight fly over the site, and basically that was used to model vegetation data. Um, it's a model, so it, as you know, you were hearing before, 
models are different from real data, but it has been ground truthed. So the yellow areas are our cotton sedge, so like the nice picture we saw of Bettersfield beforehand, and also in the top picture here. The areas showing in um, purple on the map are our heathy areas, so like this, and then the pink areas, which we have a lot of, are our cotton, are our, um, sorry, millennia, which is not what we want so much. So what we're trying to do is we're trying to get it more into the yellow and purple areas and less into the um, pink and the red, and the red is bracken. So those are the things we don't want and the things we do want. So this is just very broad scale. It's not like a perfect example because it's done off vegetation data, so it will only pick out the main species in that area, but it just gives a broad overview of the site. Um, so just because I don't want to make everyone too late for lunch, we have a very quick overview of some of the main wildlife on the site. We monitor a lot of things and we have lots of different species. So this is just picking out a few key ones. Our white faced data, as you've already heard, we have a really good population of, but that wasn't the case when we first took over as an NNR. So throughout the life project, it's remained pretty much the same because it, you know, it was already a strong population beforehand. But when we first took over the NNR, it was only really found in a really small proportion of the site on a really few small number of pools, whereas now it's widespread and across the whole of the site. So this is one of our bog specialists and it's, you know, a really positive outcome of the site being an NNR. Uh, the other two pictures are snipe and curlew. So we're basically just saying that we have breeding populations of both of those species on the site, which is, you know, quite rare for Shropshire. <coughs> and we're also one of the best sites for curlew in Wales. Um, I'll, I'll leave it at that for now. So does anyone have any questions for Neil Robert? We've got time. Um, Yeah, I think